start recording and Phil, over to you. Great, thanks a lot, Jamie. Uh, hello, everybody. Again, it's uh, late afternoon here in the in Minnesota, in the U.S. So, uh, good morning, afternoon, evening, late night, wherever you might be. So, again, as Jamie was saying, uh, what I'd like to do is continue on essentially with the same kind of case study that I introduced last week when uh, be, I began starting to uh, talk about um, system analysis and uh, system understanding and use the Colorado Pike Minnow example as a framework to start talking about how to develop and evaluate alternatives to start um, the process of, of prospective planning for solutions to given conservation problems in the planning context. So as you may remember, we, uh, going back to our, to our big fish uh, example here, uh, just, to, just to refresh your memory a little bit, we have this species in a river system in the southwestern United States where we were able to take existing biological data, abundance data, begin to develop a credible predictive model from those data and fitting that model to existing data under alternative hypotheses of data interpretation and then using that information to develop a simplified um, predictive um, estimate of population abundance and population growth over time to be to uh, to give us a a um, picture of the future for the population of this fish in this particular subbasin under what we called a status quo. Um, condition. And I guess I just wanted to very briefly mention um, or discuss this idea of a, of, a, of, a, of a baseline projection that is defined as a status quo projection. Status quo, of course, doesn't mean that, that the managers in the system are not doing anything to manage the population. They may very well be doing um, different types of management of perceived threats to the species as a way to try to improve the long-term um, future for the species, but there may be um, uh, threats that are operating at a um, high enough intensity that the existing management actions are not, are not mitigating those threats. So the status quo um, means that there's no change in the management intensity that management authorities are, are, are implementing in the system. And it also means that there's no change in the environmental conditions that, are, that may be influencing underlying um, survival and reproductive rates of the species. Um, these may be simplified assumptions that can be um, uh, discussed or criticized in a, in a participatory planning environment, but at least for the purposes of our analysis and for the purposes of simplified PVA types of um, treatments, this is, a, this is a typical kind of baseline or foundational model to build upon. So I just wanted to bring that up in our, um, in our discussion here as well, this notion of the difficulty actually of determining and defining a status quo projection. But this is basically where we ended up last, uh, last week and based on these analyses, and as you remember, we also had our life cycle diagram for the species and we were able to identify um, specific threats that were impacting different aspects of the species life history. And from these analyses, we were able to develop our conservation goals, our simplified conservation goals that um, uh, focused on specific management options that were designed or, or, or were proposed, hypothesized, to impact different aspects of the species life history. So with these basic goals, what we want to do now in thinking about changing the future for the species or, or this particular population is translate these broad goals into specific management options that we can then evaluate to determine which of these different goals and the actions that go with those goals may be most effective in um, managing the system and improving the demographics of the system to improve the long-term viability of the system and the species. <laughs> 
And collectively, these different uh, management options are often referred to as alternatives. So what actually is an alternative when we think about moving from these types of broader goals to these more specific alternatives? Well, a very simple definition is, is simply a solution, a complete solution. We'll talk about what that means in a minute but it's a complete solution to a given problem that can be directly compared by decision makers to other options, to other alternatives. So um, these, these need to be, um, or, or these, these need to be specific types of management actions taken either individually or in combination with one another to try to improve the long-term stability of a, of a biological system to improve viability of a, of, a, of a population or a species. And again, specifically, they need to be able to be compared using whatever tools are available to us, including some type of population viability tool or other types of thinking tools that you're talking about in this course and that we'll be discussing in the broader context of conservation planning. In general, a good alternative has a couple of important key characteristics. Um, obviously, they need to be they need to be complete. They need to be um, addressing key aspects of the overall problem that we're trying to address. In this case, we're trying to address population decline of Colorado pike minnow in the Green River subbasin and in trying to improve that population, um, uh, reverse that population decline to ensure long-term viability. And we wanna be able to make sure that we're comparing these different alternatives using the same metrics. So we wanna look at the same time period. We wanna use the same assumptions regarding the underlying biology of the system and the underlying me um, mechanisms by which different threats impact the species or the population in different ways. We also want to make sure that we have these alternatives addressing what we call the kind of the fundamental objectives or the fundamental values of the decision. In this case, our fundamental goal in, in recovery planning for Colorado pike minnow was to reduce extinction risk. And so we want to make sure that each one of our alternatives always points back to that kind of fundamental value that is driving the conservation planning process in the first place. We want to have very detailed alternatives that are logical and feasible and that are different from one another so that they're not just very small changes to um, a, a, a kind of larger super alternative. They want it, we want them to be very different so that we can give decision makers a pretty clear choice as to the different types of management actions that can be undertaken and how those different management actions may be combined into a, into a broader alternative that can be most effective in improving long-term persistence of the species. So these are some fairly standard kind of characteristics of what a good alternative should, should, should look like. And again, these alternatives can be taken individually or they can actually be combined. So a pretty typical way to think about deriving alternatives is in this type of a kind of strategy table, um, it's typically called. And you'll notice that I'm starting to kind of mix language here a little bit. And actually the, the, uh, the language in the decision-making literature can sometimes get a little bit confusing when we particularly when we start talking about strategies versus alternatives. Um, if, you, if you start digging into this literature a little bit more, you may start, you may start seeing these, these different um, uh, terminologies emerging. But fundamentally for our Colorado pike minnow example, what we wanna do is we wanna, as facilitators in conservation planning workshops, help people brainstorm different types of management options or management strategies. And clearly at this level, given the, given the um, identification of specific broad goals as we have here, we can identify different management strategies, different management options that link to those broader goals. So clearly a, an, a um, management strategy that could be employed is to improve the, the frequency 
that the summer flows in the Green River achieve those intermediate targets that we talked about uh, last week and which I'll get to in a minute too to refresh your memory. And so in addition to the actual explanation or identification of the strategy, we can look at the intensity of application of that strategy. So we may have, again, kind of a status quo management strat, um, uh, intensity for summer flow that um, uh, reflects no change essentially to the existing summer flow management where in the Green River Subbasin now about 10% of the years um, uh, that have recently been observed are actually showing flows within the optimal target range. So that would be kind of a baseline status quo or no change in management. We also may have additional intensities where we, through management, increase the frequency with which that management strategy or that, or sorry, where the, in this case, the summer flows hit that intermediate target. So we can define the strategy in terms of its broad, broad application and then the different intensities of application of that strategy. And similarly, we can try to derive non-native predator management strategies at different levels of intensity, or we could also employ a canal diversion strategy, a management of that canal diversion that either has a relatively lower impact or a higher impact based on the mechanisms by which that diversion is, is actually physically implemented in the river system. So with those in mind, um, and again, through um, intensive facilitated discussions, we come up with these different spe specific strategies. We can then combine these different strategies to produce different alternatives. So here, alternative A is only employing a in relatively intense level of summer flow management without changing anything in the non-native predator management or canal management above and beyond what is it what is currently being employed so alternative a could be you're really focusing your attention on summer flow management whereas on in alternative b you'll see that we have summer flow management non-native to predator management and canal diversion management working in concert um, at levels that may be a little bit lower in in, in the case of summer flow management, we're actually saying, well, if we do a relatively lower level of summer flow management, can we improve the system further by engaging in a lo relatively lower level of non-native predator management and lower level canal diversion management to offset the, the comparatively lower level of investment in summer flow management? So you can see that as you have a number of different types of strategies, and often you'll have more than three for sure, in any one kind of conservation planning um, environment, you can derive a series of different alternatives that are much more complex than these and involve different types of combinations of different intensities of management uh, or um, uh, management strategy um, uh, depictions or pictures, if you will. So with this in mind, we can then begin evaluating these different alternatives and see which ones um, uh, perform the best biologically. And so one way to, again, think about um, translating these different alternatives into the lingo or the mechanics of an analysis framework, we can think about how we actually derive, how we do this in a, in a PVA context. So here's our original, um, a uh, depiction of historical flow frequencies and the years within which we had either low levels of flow or high levels of flow or optimal intermediate levels of flow. You remember that historically it was about 50-50 in terms of where the, um, whether they were within the optimal range. More recently, we had a, a kind of a drought condition where we had high levels of low flow. But now we might engage in thinking about an alternative where now we increase the frequency, obviously, of those years in the future where we have high levels or, or, or at least optimal levels of flow. And we can actually then derive a numerical a, um, uh, definition of that flow management strategy. And then we can evaluate within a numerical risk assessment context what the impact 
of, of increasing that flow frequency to this um, particular level. And we can then look at either increasing the, or decreasing the frequency of this optimal flow um, uh, in a prospective predictive model to see what, how much um, improvement in flow we need to achieve a particular, a particular population characteristic or population state. And in this case, what we want to be able to do is compare this to other management strategies where we look at other, other types of impacts on the system. Remember that improving summer flow may itself require multiple types of activity. So this is a particular management strategy that itself may require um, uh, or could be implemented through different means. We could release a larger volume of water from stored facilities, reservoirs. We could change the way water is allocated from agricultural systems to retain it in the natural biological system. We could revise dam operations. We could actually implement this particular management strategy in multiple ways in concert with other management strategies to develop a particular management alternative, okay? And again, as I mentioned in the previous slide, it's really important to um, be mindful of the facilitation required and structured thinking required within a facilitated context to make sure that these different strategies and alternatives adhere to and conform to the characteristics of good alternatives that we uh, that we discussed earlier on. And so you're using the same kinds of um, strategies for eliciting information and managing conversations um, in a way that that allows for that free form um, flow of info and um, uh, discussion of different perspectives and ideas that allows you to first generate a larger number of these strategies and alternatives. And then you can iterate through analysis and discussion, more analysis and more discussion. You can reduce the number of alternatives down to a number that is more tractable and more optimal for long-term species management. Failed. Can I yeah. I'll just start with that point because we've covered a certain amount of ground and it would be a chance to see if anybody does have any questions. There's nobody putting anything in the chat room, so it may well be that there, there aren't any questions. But um, can I, could you, people listening, if you can think, if you've got something to ask, then just flag it up um, in the chat room just now. And I, whilst you do that, I just wanted to reiterate a point because I don't think I make it clear enough in the materials this week. And Phil taught me this yesterday um, in, the, in the first version of this, which was this business of clarifying your assumptions behind each of the alternatives. And I say, I don't think we make that point enough in this week's content on the web um, uh, about understanding what's behind, what's the sort of context in which you're assuming this alternative um, you know, may, may function. Uh, and I think that's that's quite an, an important point, which uh, really hit home to me yesterday. Um, there's nobody coming up with any questions, Phil. So please carry on. Okay, sure. Yeah, in this in this idea of assumptions, uh, yeah, we we did talk about that a little bit um, in more detail yesterday, and that is an important point that I guess I made yesterday um, with respect to. I mean, you know, each of these e each of these strategies and alternatives that emerge from a facilitated conversation, of course, fundamentally have to be considered as as at least at least feasible and at least something that we can further consider as a as a mechanism to improve viability of the species i mean we don't want to we don't want to think too too wildly to develop alternatives that we intrinsically know aren't really feasible maybe even biologically or economically or or whatever we want to you know at least kind of bound ourselves initially while at the same time thinking of all of all real uh you know achievable and and realistic and feasible options that could be considered to uh, to mitigate the threats that are currently acting on the system, and you know we can we it, the 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 issue of different management strategies impacting the the 
potential success of other management strategies can get can 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 develop into quite a complex system and quite a complex set of analyses either numerical analyses or 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 heuristic analyses right so i think it, at least we have to at least be mindful of the fact that managing the system in one way may actually impact the ability to manage the system in another way and those are always you know considerations that you need to make in a facilitated discussion and structured analysis of a, of a system involving multiple threats and multiple responses that the population may have to those threats so getting back to fish, um, so here's an example of the type of analysis you can do. Very simplified. These are the simplified graphs above and beyond what we've actually can, um, developed in our in our reports for this particular system. But what we have here is looking at managing only summer river flow, summer water flow in the Green River, at different levels of intensity above our basic status quo scenario of relatively low frequency of achieving our target intermediate flows. And as you remember, if we assume a status quo situation, clearly the population decline will continue and lead to a relatively high level uh, or high probability of very low population abundance and perhaps even a higher probability of population extinction under the the under our understanding of the system that we currently have with all of its uncertainty and all of its um, uh, variability we assume that if we don't do anything to the system we're going to continue this population decline but we can see that as we increase the frequency of optimal flow achievement we start seeing a bit of a transition point an inflection point where somewhere between um, either 50% to 60% of years or 60 to 70% of years achieving optimal flow, we begin to see success. Now, how are we measuring success? We need to be very mindful in our consequence analysis of these different alternatives and population viability analysis is fundamentally a, a method for analyzing consequences of different alternatives using the typical structured decision-making language. We have to be mindful of the metrics we're using to, to define success or evaluate the consequences of our strategies. Um, they, we could be looking at adult abundance at a particular period in time as we're plotting here. We could be looking at population growth rate over a particular period of time. We could be looking at risk of population decline below a particular threshold or perhaps even population extinction where the population declines to zero. Whatever our metric is for evaluating consequences, we want to do that on a consistent basis so that we can more easily discuss the impacts and consequences of different management alternatives. So we can see here that our alternative A that was discussed in one of the earlier slides where we, have, where we assume we can achieve target summer flows 60% of the time we begin developing, we begin seeing a positive growth trajectory over time in our, in our system under the assumptions and under the level of knowledge we have of the system as it currently stands. And we see that if we, in, yeah, do we have a question? Sorry, Joe, I was just trying to, uh, I, I can't work out a decent point to, to get in, because you don't breathe. I don't know how you manage to do it, but you're able to just keep talking. It's incredible. And um, you're, you're actually starting to address one of, I think, part of the question that Barbara's actually making. I don't know, Barbara, would you like to just ask Phil just now, make your point now about those um, unviable alternatives? Yeah, sure. Can you hear me okay, Phil? I can, I can hear you perfectly, go for it. Great. So I was, I was commenting when you said that, you know, if it, if it wasn't a feasible alternative, then there was, you know, little point in doing it. But in my experience, sometimes it's very useful to show things that are unfeasible if it's something that you think managers might be attracted to as something that will cost them less political capital. So. Let's say, for example, that uh, the managers don't really want to control river flow, but and they think that they can solve it through uh, predator control. And, and it may be biologically unfeasible to eliminate all invasive predators, uh, 
but if you show that anyway and it doesn't result in positive growth it can eliminate sort of the political wiggle room and so i i thought it might be useful to comment a bit on you know what's what's actually you're doing as the best alternatives for the species versus the other sort of sensitivity tests that are helpful to convince managers to support those rather than saying, well, why didn't you check out this alternative? Yeah, that's it. That's yeah. Thanks for pointing that out, Barbara. That's actually a, a, a very good point. And I think I was I was a little too economical in my in my language here when I when I was talking about feasibility and I um I address this a little bit. I, I, I address it briefly in some uh, slides later on down the road, where I'm talking not only biological feasibility, but economic and social feasibility as well. Um, and I guess when I was when I was discussing feasibility here in this in this more immediate context, I was really thinking about essentially kind of biological feasibility. Um, but you're absolutely right, and I have run into many situations where I know kind of intrinsically that a particular strategy or applying a particular strategy at a particular intensity, uh, I just kind of know from experience a priori that that's not going to be a particularly effective strategy. But as you say, it's important to be able to show the, the group, the diverse group that, that that, you know, the consequences of that particular strategy um, as a way to, yeah, potentially address not only the biological realities of the system, but also the, the political, social, cultural, and economic realities of the system as well. So good point. Good point. Thanks for helping me clarify that. And Jamie, I'll make sure I breathe. No, 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 don't. I'm, I'm just fascinated by how you're able to do it. You've got a different physiology to everybody else. But please keep going. It's great. <laughs> no, it's all that. It's all that cycling, right? Yeah, exactly. Generating, generating. Yeah. Well, I wish. <laughs> um, okay. All right. So here's an example. Right. Here's an example of a particular strategy being implemented and the intensity of that strategy required to achieve the desired biological result. And similarly, we can do uh, an, an analysis looking at um, uh, um, applying only a non-native fish management strategy. So presumably, we have, well, and in this, in this particular situation, we did um, attempt to develop a functional relationship between the density of non-native predators in the system and the proportional increase in mortality that occurs by that density of non-native fish predators in the system. So therefore the management strategy would be would would result in a proportional increase in young pike minnow survival as a function of reducing the non-native fish density by a given amount that functional relationship is very poorly understood so there was a lot of uncertainty and a lot of a lot of kind of squishiness around that um, relationship but nevertheless we wanted to at least explore the impact of increasing survival of younger fish by by incremental amounts to see what was what what type of consequence with all else being equal in the system what type of response our pike minnow population would show. And again, here we see that a, um, uh, a, a kind of inflection point, if you will, between just 5 to 10% proportional increase in pike minnow survival at those younger age classes, the one to four-year-old fish in this case, could show a kind of inflection or a transition from negative population growth to positive population growth in a change, proportional change, not an additive change, but just a proportional change of five to 10% survival in those younger age classes. And by further increasing that to 15% proportional increase, now you start seeing the achievement of population recovery, which in this context was defined as a particular abundance of fish. Now, again, the real problem here was that I can reflect back to the managers how much 
proportional survival increase is necessary, but the real challenge is then translating that proportional survival increase into um, uh, insight into the number of non-native fish to remove from the system. So that requires, so that really pointed out to the, to the managers the importance of gathering more information either from other systems, other river systems, other species, assemblages, or from, uh, or from expert opinion and expert judgment um, to try to get additional information on this functional relationship in the future to improve our estimates of the amount of non-native fish removal required to achieve a more positive population outcome. So this is another example of these models being helpful to a, to a degree, but then also um, uh, being limited in their, in, their pre, in their precision around making specific management recommendations based on lack of understanding of different functional relationships within the biological system. Similarly, we could look at entrain, reducing the entrainment of fish in, in, in the canals that then move out into agricultural systems, and we could evaluate these on their own um, with their own inherent data uncertainties and difficulties in translating dem pikemen of dem demography into intensity of management recommendations. But again, we start getting, comp at least in these individual strategy evaluations, we can begin to get an understanding of the relative level of effort necessary in a, in a singular application to, um, that is necessary to achieve a particular positive outcome. So all of these different alternatives have been evaluated um, singularly. Now we can start saying, well, what if we combined all of these at some level of intensity? What type of response do we see? And now we begin to start um, evaluating combinations of management alternatives where we're improving flow, we're reducing non-native predator density, and we're um, uh, capping off the canal diversion with either a high level or a relatively lower level of success or a higher level of success. And here you see that, for example, the alternative that I showed in that table um, earlier on where we do a little bit of everything, essentially, simply speaking, now has almost a kind of synergistic consequence where um, uh, if, you're, if you're doing all of these different activities to um, uh, relatively modest levels, you, be, you can begin to see very um, distinct changes in population growth that now begin to replicate those levels of, of population growth that were occurring before specific and relatively intense threats began to act on the system back in the 1990s. And we can begin to then achieve recovery of the population at a much, at a much um, more rapid rate if we, if we begin to employ these different management strategies in concert in a combined management alternative. And so once you begin to start looking at the biological kind of consequences of these, of these different alternatives, we can then go back to what Barbara was talking about earlier, when, we're, when, when we be, can then begin to do the more complex and the more interesting um, evaluation of the non-biological um, feasibility and acceptability of these different management strategies in combination with the biological feasibility or or desirability, if you will. So it may turn and, and, and in this particular case with the pike minnow, non-native predator removal turns out to be a very desirable biological outcome from the standpoint of looking at Colorado pike minnow viability. But it's a very undesirable outcome for, for um, uh, in, in the minds of particular stakeholder groups, namely fishermen who like to go to these rivers and fish for these uh, sport fish, um, bass and walleye and northern pike and all sorts of other fish that have been introduced into these rivers for, for um, recreation. 
So you then have to balance the feasibility of implementing this biologically attractive management strategy with the um, uh, social cost, essentially, of, um, of, of potentially alienating or disrupting the support of other uh, stakeholder groups that may um, need to be engaged in a broader management strategy if the long-term viability of the species is to be uh, improved. So again, this is the this is the PVA part of this. This is the biological part of it, but um, uh, this is only a small part of the larger decision-making process that is required to to um, ultimately come up with a meaningful conservation strategy or conservation plan for the species. But the PVA part provides a very helpful tool to organize information, assess information. Um, reduce redundancy in alternative derivation um, and then begin to really hone in in a comparative way on the value of different alternatives. So again, you know, as, as facilitator, we have, we, have a, we have the responsibility to work with the group to first be very open and divergent in um, uh, adopting a divergent thinking strategy. For, for evaluating or at least coming up with all these different types of alternatives. Let them, let them um, uh, be creative and organize the um, brainstorm information into coherent alternatives that are um, to which you constantly refer to these good characteristics so that these alternatives can be informative, concise, um, detailed, distinct, and logical. And then through kind of an iterative process of, of evaluation, discussion, um, reduction, and then, can, and then um, uh, additional evaluation and discussion, you can begin to really narrow down on those important strategies that then need to be further described and further fleshed out in terms of the specific actions required to make those alternatives real in the uh, in 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 on the ground management so in summary so just a couple of uh, a couple of recommended readings um, a, a lot of the information a lot of the broad information I put in here was taken from what I consider to be a really great book on on not only you know the 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 specific field of structured decision making, but also the broader field of conservation planning and conservation decision making um, writ large. It's a really great book, um, Structured Decision Making, Practical Guide to Environmental Management, um, that really lays out nicely the creation of and evaluation of different alternatives. So I highly recommend that book as a, as a, as a good practical um, complement to the conservation planning documents that we here at CPSG and others have, other organizations have put together to guide you in your facilitation of and participation in different, different management, uh, species management activities. And then, you know, there are, there are a million different papers in the um, risk, uh, wildlife risk assessment and wildlife population viability literature around evaluating different alternatives. So I just decided to be shamelessly um, self-promoting here as an example of just one, one way in which you can use these types of tools um, to evaluate different alternatives. I thought this was a slightly interesting one that sets maybe is set apart from some others in that we're, in this case, we're actually looking at trying to reduce population abundance of an invasive species, namely feral cats, instead of, um, instead of in, in increasing population abundance of an endangered species. So it's just a little bit of a twist on um, uh, using these types of tools to evaluate different management options. And a second, a, a companion paper that's in the works right now will look at the bio or the economic cost of a different biologically feasible or biologically attractive management strategies to, you know, paint a larger picture of of the bioeconomic feasibility of different strategies and how different criteria for evaluating alternatives can play off of one another. <laughs> 
So again, thanks for uh, thanks for um, hanging in here on looking at these um, different types of tools for creating and evaluating alternatives and thinking about how you use this con the consequences um, of these different analyses. And I'm happy to continue online here answering any questions or engaging in any other kind of discussion you uh, you want about these different types of ideas and thoughts. Phil, thanks so much for that. Um, so if you do want to ask a question, if you could just turn your mic on and then I can see and we'll just queue people up. Um, just whilst you think about that, um, Phil, I've just been chatting to somebody down here who's actually heads up the in-situ conservation work for Sao Paulo Zoo, uh, Chapo Bayo, and he was saying that there's, there's a, it sounds like a similar project going on in with the, your cat one um, in the, not Fernand designers, but anyway, islands off the coast of Brazil, and they are also in the post process of doing some research around the feasibility and social acceptability of these sorts of uh, uh, approaches. So there may be a, a connection there that's worth making to to, to sort of similar sorts of work. Um, Barbara, um, you had a, a, a question, and there's one other person who I'm not sure about this is waiting for name. But, um, Barbara, if you'd like to go first. Yeah, I was interested if you would comment a bit on using structured expert decision making. I know in most of the PDAs that I've worked with, there's always some important parameters for which there are no data, um, but you have some expertise in the room and you can use that expertise to draw inferences and avoid groupthink. Um, and I I haven't followed the development of Vortex for some years, but um, do you ever use that? And and can Vortex accept, you know, sort of a, a range of opinions versus doing things one at a time? Sure. Yeah. Those are. Um, thanks for that, Barbara. Those are. Those are two. I mean, I can I can deconstruct that into kind of two distinct questions. Um, one is just around the use of um, expert judgment and expert opinion and how to how to elicit that information from people in the absence of hard, if you will, hard data on on the species or system of concern. And yeah, we've been we've been exploring um, different ways to use these different types of expert elicitation tools there's a there's a lot of a lot of literature out there as you know and many of you know around the use of expert elicitation in in gathering information and you know these various types of methods the delphi method being being one and many other types of iterative um, engagement processes that can be used to gather this information and generate a range of perspective on the you know a, a a an an aspect of a biological system and in our particular case as barbara is alluding to trying to get perspective on the range of values that you might put into one of these risk assessment um uh packages or you know tools um so we're continuing to work on how to use those in a practical way in these very diverse and very um, dynamic kinds of stakeholder-based um, conservation planning workshops. And we, we use them. We're continuing to kind of refine them and use them in a more, in a more um, um, streamlined way to, uh, to, to balance the need to be able to get this information in a, in a, in a, in a way that can be relatively quickly interactive while at the same time being mindful of the group think that you've identified and some of the difficulties with relying on, you know, one person, for example, to, to get that kind of information. Um, so that's an ongoing process. With respect to the software itself, yeah, Vortex or any other kind of PVA package can or should be structured so that you can directly incorporate the the range of uncertainty around a given parameter. And we can do that. We can do that now. We, we weren't able to do that in earlier versions of the software, explicitly do it in earlier versions of the software. But now we can, where we can actually input distributions, statistical distributions reflecting the the parametric uncertainty around a given a given demographic value or demographic rate so we can directly evaluate the impact of that 
of that um, uncertainty in parameter value that emerges from that type of expert elicitation. Does that help, Barbara? Uh, I think, yeah. yeah, that's great. Yeah. But I'm glad to hear that. And, and I sent out to the group the link to uh, Mark Bergman's book on trusting judgments, which I thought was a, a really good coverage. And I'm excited to hear about Vortex incorporating that. That's great. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah, right, right. Mark's done some great stuff on on the on the 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 nuances and difficulties of of dealing with um yeah, uncertainty and and eliciting information from people it's a yeah, it's good stuff and we're we're working on making that practical in our own work thanks, yeah Jeff. thanks for sending that out and, and uh, Barbara, what, well, for everybody, what I'll do is I'll send it around in, a, in an email separately as well, so everybody else gets it uh, too. There was somebody who had a, a question, um, had their microphone on, and then it's gone off. Ah, it's back on again. So whoever you are, I'm not sure what your name is. I can't see. But if you'd like to ask your question. Uh, hi, this is Karen Schwartz. Um, I, I guess my question was similar to, uh, it, was, it was about the capacity of Vortex to um, to model management strategies and um, and impact on on populations, but I was wondering, do you ever use more than one modeling tool? Um, if it, if uh, for example, if if uh, the the situation or the or the threats or whatever are not able to to be modeled in vo using Vortex? Sure, sure. Um, I I in no way want to be seen as a person who can only speak one language. Um, in the same way that I'm really bad in um, Spanish and German, in addition to my English, um, mm -hmm. I can also speak, although hopefully I speak them better than I speak German, but I can also speak other languages of risk assessment, you know, tools and technologies. So mm -hmm. if it turns out that Vortex, you know, I mean, we happen to use it a lot, but it doesn't mean that, we, that, that it's the only thing we use. So if there is a particular system that doesn't doesn't lend itself to analysis by Vortex and there are specific, you know, characteristics, there are specific situations that um, where that is indeed true, um, we can use other other software. Absolutely, we can use other population viability software, or we can use other types of software tools to help us um, structure our thinking and make better decisions about about the characteristics of a wild population, or a captive population, or a habitat, or whatever the case might be, so that we can help people make better decisions about their about their management. Um, their their management needs and be responsive to their management needs. So for sure we do. Yeah. I mean, I mean, we find that yeah, we find that Vortex has a lot of a lot of um, advantages over mm -hmm. over some over many systems, but 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 there are some limitations to it as well. So we want to be able to adopt the right tool for the job. Can you can you give an example of where um, I, I don't know if you can think of an example that uh, Vortex text may not be the um, the tool of choice. Or... Yeah, sure, butterflies, um, insects, um, wildebeest populations. Um, oh. So, in other words, those those species that have life histories that are um, difficult to evaluate in a typical age structured individual based kind of modeling framework. Um, similarly, you know, very large populations that you might want to be evaluating impacts of different types of human interactions um, or look at the impact of different maybe types of emerging disease threats or climate related threats where again an individual based modeling framework like Vortex where every animal in the population is, is, is evaluated independently you begin to run into computational limitations when you when you have large populations. So yeah, so those are, those are the typical kinds of plants are also not very well. You know, plants are hard to deal with in vortex as well. It wasn't really designed for that. So in those situations, we we might use a a um, population based matrix type of modeling approach using a software like Ramus, which which I can speak pretty well. 
um, and uh, using GIS based kinds of applications of Rambus or other types of tools. So, so again, we work very closely with the people requesting the the analysis and the planning environment to determine what the what the what the appropriate model is or what the appropriate tools are for analyzing the information at hand. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah, sure, Karen. Okay, there's somebody else. Uh, uh, sorry, I presume that's Karen. That's yours going off. Is there anybody else who would like to ask a question? No further microphones. One last and, and, and much more sort of simple point I'd make, but just in terms of thinking about you know, what happens when, um, you know, when you, you know, in addition to the use of Vortex, what other sort of qualitative uh, thinking tools can we use and what process will we go through? And one could imagine, as Phil described before, that you might be doing you know, brainstorming and mind mapping to try and generate the alternatives in the first place. There may be a process of digging down to, through some alternatives with use of tools like pros, cons, fixes to get a bit more detail in around the alternatives. And then from that, you're hopefully going to be able to extract the few leading courses, the ones that are ahead of all the others that you could then dig down into in much more depth using um, uh, using Vortex or other sort of PVA tools. So this sort of iterative process of more those more complex or thoughtful thinking tools um, as you uh, as you try and deepen your understanding. And what you're obviously doing as well, and I think Phil alludes to this with his point about expert elicitation, is you're trying to weigh this up. You're trading this off against the time you have, where you've got to get to by the end. And so you're making this sort of balancing act between the depth of thinking and the tools that you use, where you need to get to, as well as thinking about agreement. And uh, as Phil said, you know, making sure that at this stage you're listening very carefully to what people are saying in order to capture some of the nuances and the differences between the different alternatives being considered. Um, yeah. yeah. Can I just build on that really quick, Jamie? I mean, just to kind of, again, state state perhaps an obvious point but i'm a really big i'm a really big proponent of making people state the obvious because it because it may be obvious to one person or 10 people but it may not be obvious to that 11th or 12th person in the group or in the or in the room regarding you know simple simple relationships between inform bits of information or or structures around the system we're trying to understand so i put this life cycle diagram back up on the on the screen just as a way to to as as a simple example of the need of 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 the additional insights that people get and the additional understanding that people get just by just by developing something really simple like this i mean this is not this is not complicated and not particularly sophisticated but just having something like this on the wall on a big flip chart or on a big collection of flip charts on the wall that you can always refer to um, allows people to have a common frame of reference and a common understanding of relationships, right? And using simple matrices that that um, define different um, characteristics of different um, habitat locations where a species is found. I had a um, process a number of years ago working on chimpanzees in Uganda where they were in many, many, many different isolated or semi-isolated forest blocks that had different levels of um, Nash, uh, federal protection or different levels of human population density nearby or that had where within which the chimpanzees had different threats that were impacting the populations and never had the international or local chimp biologists really put all of this information together in a simple table and we i'm sorry i don't have a um, picture of it here i do on, on my computer but not in this presentation we 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 taped together you know a dozen flip charts on the wall and just began to write out in a big table all the different sites and all the different criteria that we wanted to use to evaluate the site an enormous amount of kind of insight and discussion was stimulated simply by just putting everything together in a table. So I know Jamie's in, you know, talking about this and I just want to reinforce the value of simple tools to help structure information.
it's enormously powerful. Thanks, Phil, for that. And I think that is it. And it's the first time. It takes us, taken us four weeks to get there, but we're actually going to finish just before or, or, or on time. So thank you for getting us to that point, Phil. I'm not going to guarantee it next week because I'm the one that's doing it, I'm afraid. Um, but Phil, thank you so much for sharing your insights. Thanks to everyone for listening. If you have not yet um, got back to me on your availability for the other webinars next week and in the last week please let me know apologies for the timing particularly of week six I'm just is trying to fit in with other people's availability um, and uh, I made a point at the beginning which was that we will keep the course materials open for an extra at least an extra couple of weeks um, after the course because I'm aware that people are having to this course alongside their other work. I don't want to leave it open for too long because it's just hard to kind of, you need to have some pressure in a way to get it completed. But we'll, we recognize that there's there's got to be a bit of uh, leeway. So we'll, we will be keeping it open for uh, a, a couple of weeks uh, afterwards. So thanks very much. Have a very good week. And um, we'll speak to many of you next week. Sounds good. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it, Jamie.